Hi, I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, providing tips on language learning, culture, and human development. And I think a constant discussion woven into the fabric of our lives during the past year has been the impact of the pandemic on teachers, on students, on families throughout this past year. And I have interviewed and have spoken with teachers from all over the world, from the United Arab Emirates, from uh, Tunisia, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from Bolivia, from Colombia, from Nepal, and the list goes on and on. And I think the universal feeling of all of these teachers could be probably summarized in one word, rough, really rough. And I've greatly filtered that word and the feeling for our viewing audience. Well, in today's episode, I'm interviewing some additional teachers from around the world to try to cover new ground, especially on inequity of resources in the classroom, also classroom materials, also whether students are progressing or not in this new environment. And I think you will really enjoy today's discussion. So what I'd like to do is I want to bring on my guests for today. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Thank you, thank you, Randall. So let's go ahead before we get into the broadcast, just briefly to give each one of you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Uh, I, certainly each one of your lives, we could spend hours learning a little bit more about you. And I am actually going to move us around here on the screen. <laughs> and uh, let's just go ahead and uh, uh, get to this uh, introduction. So if we could, uh, Paulina, just take a minute to introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm Paulina from Costa Rica. I work at a technical high school for the government. It's a beautiful place. That's a picture of my school. I love it. I love the blue sky. Uh, I work with students from many different communities with many different economical situations. Uh, I have students from probably 15 to 18 years old. They are in the last year of high school, which is uh, very important for them. And since this is technical education, they are looking forward for a good job. So they, are, they have clear goals in their lives. All right, thank you, Paulina. And Sudeep, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sudeep Kesi from Nepal. I represent Arjun English Boarding High School. The place uh, where the school is located is called Tamgas. Then the district is Gulmi. So it's a small valley, as you can see, it's surrounded by hills. The population of the place is around 35,000. Um, oh. And basically, for me, uh, it is located in a semi urban area of Western Nepal. And thank you, Sudeep. And Esther Vasquez, if you could uh, introduce yourself. Okay, well, I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I work at several uh, different uh, middle schools. And uh, then I am a teacher at UBA University, that is La Universidad de Buenos Aires. And I'm a teacher trainer. Uh, we train, we are a team of five, around five teachers who, teacher trainers, who train around 2,000 teachers in the city of Buenos Aires. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. And I just want to recognize some of the people that are joining us from Vietnam, uh, Sharad from uh, Nepal. And I'm not going to get all of these names quite uh, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdullah from Turkey. Wonderful. Uh, again, as someone else from Nepal, I can't read that. Uh, <laughs> perhaps it's someone that you know. Uh, uh, oh, and uh, Mona says, Sudip, Paulina, and Esther, welcome. And uh, again, Hello, we have Chris supporting your, perhaps a colleague of yours, Paulina? Yes. Yes. All right. And it's wonderful. To, again, thank you so much for uh, all of you joining. And of course, what we want to do is we want to make sure that all of you feel a part of this discussion. Our topic today is how the pandemic has reshaped our teaching, our lives in this pandemic era. And so we encourage everyone who is watching to share your experiences, how they reflect uh, some of the things that are being sp shared today and how they might be unique and different. So to start off, a lot of times teachers want to know 
how are the lives, your lives, your teachings, experiences similar to their own? So briefly, Paulina, Sudeep, and Esther, very briefly, tell us about the number of classes you teach, the number of students, whether you teach online, face-to-face, -face, and so forth. Paulina, if you could start us off. Okay, perfect. I teach, um, we are working on distance education now is some days is uh, we have students in class in the school and some others we give support distance support through different platforms um i teach esp so i have students from accounting electrotechnia secretariado different uh, different areas and um I, I right now i don't remember how many students i have there are many because we have like 20 per class or so a lot and we are just starting over so we're getting everything on track back on track we just started on February. Great, uh, and, and thank thank you. And Sudeep, <laughs> <laughs> if you could tell us a little uh, bit about your second. I teach at Urgent English Boarding High School. Uh, this school is located in semi-urban area of Western Nepal. Uh, it is a private school owned by my family. Uh, the strength of class is thirty-five. Uh, the teaching model is blended, both online and offline, and I take five classes per day. Okay, thank you. And Esther, describe your situation right now. Well, uh, as a teacher at middle schools, I work at four different schools, and that amounts to, well, I, I have six different uh, classes um, divided into these uh, schools. All the schools are in the outskirts of the province of Buenos Aires, and uh, since we haven't started classes, I mean, this year yet, uh, what I could tell you about last year it, it, is that we had nearly nothing of face-to-face -face teaching and learning. Yeah. We mostly worked through platforms and well, we tried to arrange things through different, let's say, uh, means so that we could really get through all the students. And at university, yeah, we, we worked uh, on, a, on a weekly basis uh, with online teaching and with teachers doing the teacher training too. We had a regular basis. We could work very well with adults. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And one of the things, as I always say, a lot of times people want to know whether our stories resonate with them, or if we're in similar situations or not. And just the other day, I was speaking with a teacher who has 150 students in an mm -hmm. online class. So we're trying today to share experiences that would resonate, that would still speak to everyone, no matter what circumstance they might find themselves. And I encourage teachers who are watching, students who are watching to describe your experiences. The next thing is, tell me one word, it has to be one word that describes 2020 in one word. You can't elaborate, you can't go on <laughs> and explain. Esther, one word. Uncertainty. <laughs> Uncertainty. Paulina. Challenging. Challenging. And I see Sue Deep is thinking. <laughs> well, I no, for me, it's uh, volatile. It's what? Um, volatile. Yeah, volatile. Yeah, it's just kind of that changing uncertainty and so forth. And I think probably many people are feeling uh, the same thing. Uh, and uh, Shamim is joining us as well from Iraq. And uh, we have other people who are joining us as well. So this is wonderful. Let's just now get into the topic. First of all, what has been the greatest challenge to your own personal life if you feel that you can share? And I'll start off with uh, Sudeep. Just okay. anything of that nature. So uh, 2020 has increased anxiety and loss of stability and joy. Okay, for yeah, my joy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, however, it has opened door for and like it has opened door for new and exciting possibilities in technology integration. Like in technology wise, it's going great, but in personal and mental wise, it has been a real challenge. Okay, thank you, Paulina. Speak to that uh, idea. Mm, I think the greatest challenge was was uh, it it is to balance family life i'm a single mother and work like having the two things together at, at home and dealing with the housework and the children and the work from the students and the classes i think for me that was like the greatest challenge oh it can be extremely different <laughs> and, and, and esther what about yourself 
Well, I would say that I found it very difficult to cope with everything in the same place. Uh, being a mother, um, being in charge of the house, being a teacher, uh, it was overwhelming. One word that I would also use is that. Uh, then I tried to cope with this and to learn uh, new, let's say, uh, strategies to cope with, I mean, this uh, difficult situation because it was an issue at the very beginning. So I would say that, as Sudeep said, I agree with you that um, at times it was difficult, yes, as you just said, uh, <laughs> to kind of organize everything. I felt really overwhelmed more than once. I totally yeah, I feel true, true. I totally feel you there completely yeah. from we're in the same page. <laughs> Yeah, and I would certainly as part of the live broadcast, we want to hear from other people who uh, have experienced different challenges in the past up until now and perhaps future challenges. And we're going to dive into that uh, in many ways. The next question, which we will, we will be covering throughout this broadcast, is in what ways has the pandemic changed your teaching? We know as we were preparing for this broadcast, we're going to address these ideas in more detail. But just basically, if you could say this is in one way in which the pandemic has changed me, and we invite certainly those that are watching as well to share their experiences, what would that be, Esther, to start us off? Well, basically, uh, I had to learn certain platforms I knew about but had never dealt with. So I had to learn a lot. I remember when I had one of, of my friends who lives in the States having a video conference with me to teach me how to use Zoom, how to, uh, let's say, organize a meeting and how to send it to others. It, it, now I see it as such an easy thing, but I had to have somebody teaching me. So, well, I've learned to learn things that I didn't know how to, to use so as to get to more students. But it's been tough because many of my students do not have uh, connectivity. So I still feel that um, we've tried to keep connection, but sometimes without connectivity, it's been a real hard issue. And let, let's lead that into the same ideas. When you were talking about uh, how it has changed your teaching, we're also talking about logistical challenges facing you, your students, parents. Paulina, what is it like in then Costa Rica? Again, we have Argentina with Esther, Nepal from Sudip, and Costa Rica from Paulina. Describe some of the logistical challenge, Paulina. Well, it's a lot of work logistically and uh, even fixing up the classrooms for the amount of students that we can have now in a class, for example, was like a, a week work. Because in the past, we used to have 35, 40 students in one classroom. So now we can have only 10. And we had to remove a lot of furniture, take out a lot of staff so we can have 10 students and then try to organize the work, the ones that are working at home and the ones that uh, have zero connectivity. So we have to send them the papers and the ones that we have in class, sometimes a lot at the same time, right? And, um, and also like being aware of the challenges our students are having, no connection, no, no, no mobile phones, or maybe they have mobile phone but no internet at their places or they have the access but they don't have the money to get the devices so it's yeah, a real it's challenge very, very challenging yeah how about sudeep in your area of nepal um for me like communication between home and the school has always been a challenge even when all the schools were open and there was no any pandemic to worry about yeah. But like when school moved to remote learning, uh, the, the, this challenge only intensified. So for that, uh, we did weekly phone calls home. We had to organize, we had to prepare like separate Facebook group where you could connect with the parents. And even for the teachers, we used Zoom and Teams for the meeting. Mm. And Everything I'm was online. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we're talking about lack of computers, smartphones, reliable connections, emotional stress, loss of employment. And I'm interested for those of you that are out there that are teaching classes of like 80, 90, 100, how in the world have you been able to balance out those particular situations? I think is critical to the discussions. 
Um, just a couple of things. We have Hazel saying hello to you, Paulina. Uh, greetings from Bolivia, uh, Claudia. And this is perhaps one of your uh, teachers, students, colleagues. Um, <laughs> my, my student. He says, one of my students, I'm a student of Sudeep. He is a really great teacher, both online and offline. Tell us why. He has many experiences to teach us different students of different mentality, maybe different learning styles and so forth. He manages different resources. He is a really hardworking teacher. Great to hear that. Um, also, here is uh, Shamin. Shamin is uh, in Iraq, and she says, the pandemic made me look for new platforms and different apps which could help my students instead of teaching materials. We're going to dive into that of course, a little bit more as part of the broadcast. And oh, someone from the student. All right. It's great to see those here. So let's get in, into some of the other questions as well. And the next thing is, what is one thing, and this is related because we have people from around the world, and one of the challenges, as you know, some teachers say, Sudeep and Esther and Paulina are not speaking to my situation. My situation is quite different. But... Is there anything you would like people to know, Sudeep and Esther and Paulina, of a specific challenge in your area that others might not see in yours or theirs? Any unique challenge that, oh, I'd really like people to know that in Costa Rica, in Nepal, where I live, or in Argentina, where I live, that I really want people to know of a unique situation that you might not find somewhere else? anyone that could speak to that uh we do not have internet access in most of the town where i live mm -hmm. so the parents it was very difficult for my parents to get access to virtual classes they oh. actually had to purchase mobile data and it's way too expensive in nepal okay. for the classes okay so and you're saying in most of your area in in the mm -hmm. city where you live yeah yeah okay. exactly this that even the internet is very expensive and so let me speak to this for a moment about the differences in private schools and public schools, because this could lead into the idea of inequity, right? Inequity. So Sudeep, to speak to that, and then Paulina and Esther, when you say, uh, Sudeep, in most of my city, there's not reliable internet connections, how is this disparity uh, different, for example, like a public school or a private school? Do you see differences in resources and inequity in that particular case? Uh, exactly. Like in private school, as it's privately, privately owned, uh, the resources are a bit few because it's not like the government doesn't help. It's not government funded organization. But in government school, there are a lot of resources because the government fund those schools. So there's a kind of gap. So so what is happening to one of your friends that teaches down the road, is in a public school, does not have internet, what are they doing? Uh, even in the pandemic, uh, what they used to do is they used to collect students from certain area and they used to teach them like uh, even in open spaces. Mm. Even in such condition, like they used to collect students from the from their area, and they used to teach them in like open ground or somewhere, somewhere around that. You mean like outside or somewhere? Outside, yeah, yeah, outside. Okay. okay. In the ground or some public places that are open, so they used to collect students. So teachers trying to be very creative in in whatever space they have. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Because That's there was like lack of resources. So yeah. That was the only options left. And we're interested. If you're in that situation, like Sudeep is mentioning, what are you doing? Please share with us. Esther and then Paulina speak to that idea of an inequity of resources. Yes, I've seen it mostly, as I said before, at middle school, right? The schools where I work are state-run schools, and some students do not have more than one device at home, and they had to share it with others. So it's not just a question of the connectivity. It's a question of not having uh, devices enough. And so that's why we had very few synchronic lessons, because it would be, in some way, it would have been a bit unfair to, I mean, just fix 
times during the day when they had to be there because sometimes they work with the, the smartphone that the, the, the father, the mother or somebody takes to work. So uh, we mostly went, uh, let's say, through classroom. And uh, then we learned two different at the beginning. We thought we were going to send some kind of work for them to do and some explanations once a week. And then we started kind of, I mean, uh, splitting work and sending them tasks, but not one week, let's say, after the other, so that they really had time to cope with all that they had to do. That's one thing we learned gradually. At the beginning, we thought we, we, would, we were going to be able to keep something more kind of smooth, and it was not that way. Yeah. Good. Paulina, thank you, Esther, for sharing that. Uh, mm. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. Well, well, well. <laughs> I'm impressed by, by Sudeep, what, what he just said, because in Costa Rica, private schools have a little, a little bit, I will say, a lot more resources. Parents are the ones that are paying for that education. So usually we, when you send your kids to a private school, it's because you have some economic advantages, maybe. And so students have more resources, they have more materials, right. they got materials at home printed by the school, uh, a lot of platforms probably that are a lot better than the ones that we use in public education because the government has to split the money it has for education to many, many, many schools. And thank God we have in Costa Rica a lot of schools, which is really good, and high schools and, and different programs for, for each interest, almost like yeah. uh, sports or arts or technology technological schools or technical schools like mine but splitting the money the government splitting the government to all those schools is not an easy task and i think as i agree with with esther like we have to go week by week day by day like setting up what we're going to do and and like testing and with what works better for each one and some things work for some students but some others don't work like that so it, it's like a daily work yeah mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the challenges is that I think a lot of people often talk about thinking outside of the box, but sometimes we have to think well, way outside the box. I mean, it's like- In many different boxes. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. And people are sharing, if I can uh, share with you, we have people are saying, of course, greetings to each one of you. And Mesa from the United Arab Emirates mentions the following, she says, for a lot of teachers, the greatest challenge is to cope with all the technology that has suddenly popped up and be able to learn how to deal with it. So it's like, how do I grapple with all of this new technology? It's students could be better than teachers because they were born knowing everything. But yet, it's kind of like a flood. Sometimes I think with technology, it's like taking a drink out of a gushing fire hose. I mean, yes. so much information is coming out of it. It just can be overwhelming. And mm -hmm. uh, also we have uh, someone who is uh, greeting all of you. Uh, Jonathan, uh, thank you for saying greetings to all of us. And Mona mentioned from Tunisia, and I, I would like to hear, even if you're in Tunisia or in Nepal or in Argentina, probably the, the vast resources yeah. that are available and not available to teachers is probably huge. And Mona says, in my school, we don't have internet access in the classrooms. So I have to rely on myself to provide internet, which can be challenging for many yeah. teachers. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that is. Uh, for example, Sudeep, in your class, in your school, do you have internet access? No. no, in my school I have, but not in the classroom as Mona said. Okay, of so classroom yeah. that do not have internet access. Okay, uh, which is challenge. And Mona says hybrid learning is not possible in all schools in Tunisia. Thank you for sharing that. When we speak about one country, it's not representative of every school there. Mm -hmm. uh, pupils can have access to internet at home, so it's mainly face to face. Uh, which is really important uh, here uh, and uh, here when the pandemic started, the government took the initiative to reach maximum students running classes topic wise via radio, television, mm -hmm. an hour a day with different subjects. So I think many governments are trying to 
think of different ways. And again, Sudeep, being a student of some of the, the great teacher around the world is proud moment for their students being able to share your experiences. And I, I think this is reflective of uh, Sudeep, of the impact that you've had. Um, let me read one com more comment and then we'll go on. Uh, Mesa says, I think the United Arab Emirates students found equality in almost all schools because mm -hmm. the Ministry of Education offered a lot of facilities to students. Also, the telecommunication organizations responded positively. But I don't think that is reflective of every country, of every mm -hmm. experience and so oh, forth. No. <laughs> no, not at all. It would be great if it were. <laughs> Um, let's talk. The next question is in what ways has technology helped or hindered teaching and learning? Esther, could you speak to that particular, first of all, how has it helped you and how has it not helped you at all? Well, I, I learned uh, how to use some apps, right? And I think that my students, those who could, let's say, have uh, synchronous lessons, uh, as I said before, mostly that was at university. Uh, we could have fun lessons. Let's say we could revise the material, see it, and not just talking, but using certain apps that made, uh, let's say, the, the work um, funnier, I would say, easier. So I would say that it helps in that sense and hindered because of what we've been saying, or most of us have been saying, that because some students do not have a connectivity, um, we found it very difficult to reach them. So that showed inequity. We did not reach many students, actually. So it's been very hard. Thank you. Uh, Paulina Sudip, to speak to that particular question as well. I think it has helped a lot. We have learned a lot. We teachers, right? Like a lot of new apps, a lot of web pages, a lot of resources that were completely new for us. I have never heard of Zoom. I've never heard of Teams until I had to use them. And, that, and now I enjoy them. But uh, again, for students, it just made the gap more obvious, right? It just makes it, that difference between one another. It, now it's very obvious. And that's not also psychologically good for them. Right. Sudeep, any thoughts? Yeah, and you I, I, share agree, yeah, I agree with both of them. It's like I was being, I got familiar with so many technologies like Google Classroom, Padlet, Flipgrid. And then the for me, the Hindu was like, as I would say, like struggling with the availability of gadgets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things, if I go back, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, someone mentioned Zoom. I said, Zoom what? What is, what is Zoom? And I look back now, you know what? I wish I had invested in Zoom back in 2016 <laughs> or 17. I might not be doing this today, but I think some, I'm sorry, Sudi. <laughs> no, I think many of us, when I look at it, I think it's helped. It's propelled our learning forward. But I think, and I think what is happening for many teachers, oh, well, you can use this and you can use this and this, but it can be just overwhelming. The options can be, it yes. can be almost a hindrance, I think, to many people as well. It's true. Uh, if, if I can say something. Absolutely. We've learned to, to help others. And I, I've received lots of help from colleagues, from people whom I never met face to face in my life. And that was amazing how much we've tried to teach each other so that we could, Randall, actually, I met you like that when you <laughs> were trying to help me to, to use Hopin, that platform I had never used and I had never heard of when we were at Beta Bolivia. And well, it was thanks to you that I could use it and feel comfortable and we've never met. So I think I have a lot to give thanks for to colleagues around the world. And I think one of the, you were mentioning a conference that we presented at uh, in Bolivia in January, the opportunity of learning together. And that's how mm -hmm. I meant, you know, I met Sudeep through the internet and, uh, and uh, up here, uh, Paulina. And I think that's one of the enriching experiences it has been uh, to meet so many people. As we think about this, the next question is, how has the pandemic impacted the emotional well-being of you your students and your colleagues. Paulina, could you start and then Sudeep? 
uh, this is for me one of the most like uh, heartbreaking topics. Uh, I have talked to my students this first week, so asking them. The first I did is ask them, "How do you feel? How how do you feel now that we're back?" And most of them said, "Teacher, this has been so stressful and so tiring, and I was so depressed. I didn't want to go out of my room." And they are teenagers. They are 16, 17 years old. You're supposed to feel like that when you're a teenager. So for teenagers, for my students, it's been difficult. It's been tiring, stressful, depressing. And I think for us teachers too, it's been super stressful. I see my colleagues sometimes driving themselves crazy, trying to cope with everything, try to get everything done in the best way, because we like to do the things the best way. It's, right. And sometimes it's really hard. Good. Sudeep. Yeah, I agree with Paulina. Like for the students, they were, they were like, like very, uh, hard to say, but they were going through like stress. Like they had to sit all day home doing nothing, and there was no classes, and they were like, like they were, they had nothing to do. It, like they were like somewhere even renting a small room. They were staying with like three, four family members in a single room, and that was that was very painful to listen to stuffs. And I think a lot of people, when I think about this topic, uh, people and colleagues and friends who are losing jobs, losing their e economic stability, and also family members. Sorry, uh, and, and also sorry, and also I have because of that economical situation, I have a lot of students that are working. Since I, since we we work on a rural area where we have uh, coffee plantations and stuff like that, many of my students are like, "Teacher, I have to work. I have to go to work, and then in the afternoon I get home and I try to do whatever I had to do from the school, but I have to help my family with some money, and that's also hard." That can be extremely hard, uh, Esther. If you could share, in what way have you been able to maintain <laughs> your sanity? So certainly. The pandemic has affected so many people, teachers, students, families, uh, economically, socially, and so forth. But what are some of the things, and certainly we would ha be happy to hear other teachers share that impact in their own lives. But what have you done personally, Esther, to sometime, somehow maintain your sanity in this really difficult and trying time? Well, two things that I started uh, to do in order to kind of, I mean, leave uh, the screen in front of me, which I mean, was something that was hard to do because I felt that, as I said before, it was hard for me to organize myself. Everything had to happen in front of a, of a screen. So two things I did was I started walking my dog uh, and that was great because I, he, he is a very good companion. So that was new to me because I have a big garden. And so he does not need to be walked, let's say, but still it was amazing. I loved it mm. and it helped me, uh, helped, uh, me a lot. And then I started a writing workshop, which oh, helped great. me a lot as well. Um, in October, I contracted uh, COVID too, that was very hard. Mm. And so um, it took me nearly a month to recover. So that again, I mean, put me in a certain stability. But then, well, as I told you, these two things were different and they helped me um, a lot to try to maintain sanity. <laughs> try, I think try. <laughs> try. So, Sudeep, what about you? What was your secret? Mm, for me, it was, <laughs> I was like, I binged towards the series. It was like, I've never watched like continuously. And then I also did a lot of online trainings. Mm -hmm. I used to take like six, seven trainings a day. Wow. That's, that's yeah. to me. An online training. Yeah. yeah. For some Glad people. Online trainings, like <laughs> it was there, like. Yeah. And uh, for some people, they find, you know, meaning and doing that type of activity. That's great. Paulina, what about you to maintain your sanity? I, I I get back on my bike. I went mountain biking, uh, sometimes <laughs> early in the mornings, especially on weekends. It's something that I have enjoyed a lot and it's, it's, it has given me a lot of health too. I, le I bake. I learned how to bake with my daughters so with baking. And I also have been taking care of plants. Oh, and okay. now that I have to go back to school, 
uh, I miss my plants from home, so I, I took uh, two plants to the to the to my classroom. So I have them there every time I watch it. I'm like, oh hi, darling, morning. I water them, take them to the sun. It's something that I've never done before. So those are the three that have helped me, like distracted from the screen. So there's it. Yeah, and one of the things I've taken up, I've, I've done more mountain biking here in Utah. Yeah. There are a lot of mountains, and the ups and downs of climbing and descending. Uh, sliding on ice because there's still ice and snow in the mountains where I ride a little bit and sliding and you know, running into a tree. All of those are reflective of the highs and lows of the pandemic because it <laughs> certainly can be a deep challenge. Uh, yes. Mona says from Tunisia, she says, my students have been through a lot of stress during the lockdown, but felt a kind of relief when they were back to school. However, they always say it will never be as it was before. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope that overall in a positive way, but certainly we know that uh, loss of life and loss of employment have been certainly uh, really difficult. And Layla says the pandemic gives an opportunity to reorder mm -hmm. our priorities, mm -hmm. to rethink of what we're doing in, in, in our lives. Thank you, Layla, for that comment. Uh, next, the, a lot of times people ask, to what extent has the pandemic impacted student progress in terms of how quickly students are learning, trying to catch up and so forth? Uh, if Sudeep, if you could start us out and then Esther. Mm, yeah. Online learning has been changing the face of education system for quite long. Today, it is an integral part uh, in the broader landscape of providing education. So it's a little surprise uh, that online learning is getting more popular and meaningful. Uh, it provides new opportunities uh, for the students to deliver content in which they can relate to. And besides, it also helps them to develop digital literacy so that they could communicate with the with the lectures, with the content and peers in a more effective way. Okay, so engaging in content, learning new skills to learn online have been some gains to that. Some Esther, gains, yeah. any thoughts about that? Definitely, this that you've just said is something which has been positive. They've learned to cope with new things which probably would have taken longer, yes, if this pandemic has not had not existed. Um, I would say that um, the same as when we are, I mean, in face-to-face -face lessons, students have different readiness levels, the different learning modalities. So this um, makes you to think about different strategies to get to them. Having to teach them online, especially when we, for example, in Argentina, we met them and I had, I had not met some of my students by the time I started with online lessons. So I had to plan for the whole. And uh, so I think that must have impacted a lot on some students who probably, if I had been face to face, I would have realized needed an extra support. And so it was harder to know when to give extra support, what type of extra support. So in that sense, definitely, apart from all the things we've been saying so far, it must have impacted in their progress. We'll see it this year. We are just about to start lessons now in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Now, one of the things, and I want you to speak, if Paulina, to this as well, if by chance, one of the things I'm constantly hearing in our area, in public schools, is that teachers feel that public school children are falling farther and farther behind. In other words, Yes, we have all of these new technologies, but because they were doing remote learning in a time where teachers were just trying to figure out how technologies work, a lot of teachers are feeling, no, my students, yeah, they're learning new skills, but also I'm having to try to play catch up. Any thought, yeah. Paulina, in your own particular classes? I think, I know sometimes we feel like we're chasing students and parents like chasing them to get them back on the track, right? Because it's very difficult. Like, and as you said, they are getting behind and behind and behind because we cannot get to all of them the way we do when we have them in the class. And I totally agree with Esther down there. Yes. <laughs> right? <It's>, um, yes. <laughs> when you have students face to face, you, you, you can 
read their body language and notice what's going on. But when you don't have them like that, you have to figure it out what's going on. If he's not in the classes because he doesn't have connection or just because he doesn't want to or because he's working, he's not getting into the rooms because he is sleeping, because he's depressed. So there are many scenarios there that are very difficult to handle. And yes, it, it took us in Costa Rica, it took us like a month to get on track with the platforms and then like some more time to get on evaluation process that we were going to choose. And now that we're back, it's a similar process. I mean, we're just figuring out everything, how everything yeah. is going to work. So obviously it's not the same. And, and some of them will be, we'll have, we'll find more difficult situations. Yeah. I, th I think for me personally, when I started teaching online with these new classes, I felt I could only get through maybe 75% of what I used to be able to do through online uh, in a face-to-face -face environment. I was able to do everything I had planned, but an online environment, I could only get through 75%. But mm -hmm. as I've learned better, as I've learned to customize my lessons yeah. using technology ju judiciously, balancing things out, I'm getting closer to what I used to be able to do in a regular class. Maybe Random. other people are more skilled than I am, but it just was a learning curve for and me. Someone said it before on the comments, we learn to prioritize. So we learn mm -hmm. which were the most important things that we want our students, like which is like the core of this. So let's work over this. And yeah. then yes, exactly. We reorder mm -hmm. our priorities and we chose which ones are the ones that are really important. Like we must get to this. Uh, topics or these contents or this pronunciation or uh, whatever it is and let's figure it out with the others how are we going to handle on, right. on on the track absolutely and thank you Layla for bringing that up certainly new technologies are revolutionizing what we're doing and I think we're benefiting and playing a little bit of catch up and learning how to do things best a few more questions before we wrap up today's episode in the pandemic era, what do you think are some of the qualities of effective teachers, of online teachers in online environments? Perhaps some are similar to the past, but how have your own qualities changed over time because of the pandemic? Esther and then Paulina. I would say something I said <clears throat> when answering one of the questions, one of the issues is to try to connect with students. If you connect, if you try to create a bond uh, through whatever means, things will work in the short and in the long run, but creating connectivity because connection is not enough. It's connectivity uh, and connection. Yes, internet connection. But if you cannot connect, I mean, that, that, that drive we humans have for, I mean, human connection, that, that's what we have to first if we want to be effective, that's my humble opinion, we have to try to go for. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that idea on human connection. Pa uh, Paulina, any thought? I totally, I totally agree with, uh, with Esther. I was thinking about engagement. You need to get your students engaged in their learning process, in their, mm -hmm. their responsibilities as students, right? Yeah. Because it's, at the end is their learning process. So engagement, and I would say creativity, like being creative and trying to find whatever it's a hint with your students, whatever hits them that will make that engagement. Absolutely. Those are like two. Yeah, and Sudeep, what do you think? Uh, this pandemic <laughs> has taught me to become more patient, I guess, because uh, <laughs> while, while you're taking online classes, a lot of things happens. Like some, some joins early, some that there are background noises, some leaves, like, there are a lot of things happening around. So what you need to do is you have to stay calm and like and have <laughs> yeah. patience to tolerate. Good. Self self compassion. Yes, it's yeah. Empathy. Yeah. Empathy. And self and self compassion too. Because at times yeah. we, we we know that our lessons worked well. At times we realize that did not work well enough. We sometimes have a, a a child or a dog around and you know that you probably you were not expecting that visit and yes i mean this question of being self-compassionate too that will make you more effective and i think those are excellent points so the idea actually esther on my bookshelf i have a book on empathy and self-compassion right next to each other 
Okay. And the idea of, for me, of radical acceptance, radical compassion, radical empathy are all at the core of what we do. And this just gives me an opportunity yeah. to meet you, Esther, right? To meet you up there, yeah. Paulina, <laughs> uh, Sudeep. These opportunities I never imagined. And so mm -hmm. the idea of reaching out to people, I think, is so critical. So uh, uh, to wrap up, what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, look at a couple of other comments that have come in. Uh, one Mesa says student progress depends mostly uh, on cooperation between parents and schools and teachers and teachers, I think. Once rules are set, um, all have to follow. And that is exactly what we have followed in our schools. Schools contact parents if children are late or not attending. So reaching out, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Layla mentions, it's hard for students to learn about online technology and focus on the content of lessons, maybe mm -hmm. trying to balance two things or five things at the same time, I think are really uh, key. Uh, another uh, engaging tone and creativity with time management is I think uh, important. And here's another comment uh, from maybe one of your students, Sudeep, but I think is well uh, spoken. The pandemic has to teach, uh, teaches many students uh, different fields maybe. Pandemic has introduced students to Microsoft Team, Zoom, Google Classroom. You mentioned uh, Sudeep, I think earlier, that was new to you, is that correct? Yeah, it was very new to us. Right, it's so, benefited yeah. all of us. Uh, Victor from Mexico says, I totally agree with Esther. I strongly believe we have to find a connection with our students during the first day of class. I open up uh, a, cer a certain way and show them that they can achieve great results mm -hmm. in their own particular way while studying English. I also believe we need to sell ourselves to our students. <laughs> Nobody learns from someone they don't like. So being mm -hmm. really positive and creative are really key. Thank you, Victor from Mexico. So the last two questions. Question number one is, what advice do you give to people who are considering a career in teaching, but now since the pandemic are wondering if it is right for them? Sudeep and uh, then Esther. Uh, as I have said earlier, my advice is like, uh, have patience. <laughs> Everything will work out eventually and giving something you know to students is very rewarding yes it is okay good so having patience uh, esther and uh, i fully agree with with what we've been saying before um prior to 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 the broadcast um i cannot be neutral if you love teaching if that's your passion go for it it's really rewarding. It's really amazing. It's very challenging, but it's uh, the, the profession that creates all professions. But apart from it, mm -hmm. uh, you have the chance to really become a better self if you're humble enough. I love teaching, so go for it. <laughs> great, great, great. And uh, Paulina, if you could start us off, I'm going to have each one of you speak to this question. And those that are watching the broadcast, Feel free now to share any of your final comments about the pandemic, how it has impacted your learning, your teaching, what you see for the future, any tools that you've learned. But Paulina, if you could start us out, what are your predictions for the future of education in 2021 and beyond? I always try to be very positive. So I think it's gonna be great. We have learned a lot already and we're just adjusting some details to make it even better from now on. And again, I'm, I'm, I like to be positive. I prefer to be positive. There are many things that can go wrong, but as Sudeep said, um, it will turn out well at, at last. And at some point it will work out and we will uh, find a way. We, teachers have that, we have that magic, like to create and, and make things mm -hmm. that were not good, even better than they were supposed to be. Um, so it, it's going to be a good, it, it's going to be a good 20, 21, just uh, all that we have learned, it's going to be part of this and we already know how to adjust ourselves to different situations. It's something that we already learned from last year that was a lot of changes uh, to our lives and to our schools and to our students. So 
it's going to be really good. Great. Thank you. Esther. I fully agree with Paulina and I, I love this posture that she takes. Uh, <laughs> let's be on the positive side. Uh, we know that we've learned probably, and I take it as a general thing and I may be wrong, but I think that uh, we've learned that um, new things could come, that we were not ready for everything, that we have to be humble enough and uh, stay on the positive side. Everything will pass. Uh, yes. Stay on the positive side. Be firm on your convictions. Work hard. Be good. I mean, 2021, 2020, or whenever in the future, uh, the world will be a better place if we all individually uh, collaborate and help with our little bit of, let's say, uh, of what we do. Great. And Sudeep, any thoughts? Uh, as Paulina, like the word she, she said before, like, it's like ma magic. So yes, teachers are magician. Whatever <laughs> happens, they're all prepared for like everything. We're prepared for whatever comes in the future. And I think that has been echoed throughout the broadcast. Uh, one of the comments that has come in, yeah, Penang, the pandemic has been very difficult for students who live in the countryside, in the village side, as they have no internet connection, neither laptops, no computer have created, but just this type of situation has created so many challenges. And one of the things that Layla, Layla, this is a, Layla is saying, can you give us some easy and new lawn, new online applications? I think perhaps that would be a good opportunity to do a separate broadcast of yeah. focusing on, yeah, you're talking about the Bronner landscape. You're giving different ideas, uh, mm -hmm. but maybe talking about specific give, you know, we mentioned zoom and we mentioned this and that, but maybe going to more specifics could be useful. And then Mesa from the United Arab Emirates says, in order to be successful teacher during the pandemic, you need to be a multitasker, patient, right? Tech savvy, computer technician. If you have all of these qualification, qualifications, then go for it. You are a champion. And if I could end up by thinking about this idea, what do I think is coming down the pipeline for 2021 beyond? I have no idea. It's kind of like, for me, change is inevitable. It's like, buckle up your seatbelt and enjoy the roller coaster ride. ride because there'll be yeah. highs and lows. And I'm just hoping that creating such a community like this with you, Paulina, and uh, Esther, and Sudeep gives people an opportunity to, to have hope and positivity in all that they do. So we want to thank all of you that have joined the broadcast. Thank you so much for being a part of our voices today. We really appreciate you sharing your ideas, your opinions, because that's what really changes what we do. And all of us want to, well, uh, to, to hope for, for a wonderful today and an even better tomorrow. Until mm -hmm. the next broadcast. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.